Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be going through taxis and kinesis for your A-level barge. Now we're going to be taking this through really slowly, we're going to be looking at everything that you need for this topic and then we're going to be linking it to all the other parts. If you want more help with this then there are loads of questions waiting for you over my website. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at taxis and kinesis, uh, which are animal responses to stimuli. So, first of all, responses to stimuli help to increase chances of survival by helping animals to avoid predators, avoid wealth stresses, and increasing access to resources. So, avoiding predators literally just means they can run away um, or they can move away from an area. Um, they can spend more time in somewhere that's covered or shaded or something, so that helps to protect them. Avoiding abiotic stress by responding to their environment surroundings, so they're being able to detect temperature, humidity, water availability, light, and move in accordance to how they need to, depending on those factors. And then increasing access to resources, so get more water, get more food, go towards where there might be mating opportunity. All of these will involve some form of movement and thinking about like migrations and things like that happen as well with things like this. So they make sure they move to where they know there's going to be more water. What we're talking about here in terms of responses, we're going to be talking about some innate responses. So all animals have to respond to their environment and so do all plants. But we're going to be talking more about innate behavioural responses so taxis and kinesis than kind of just general behavioural choices. So if you remember, hopefully from GCSE, a change to an internal or an external environment is what we mean by a stimulus. So there'll be some kind of change and their behaviour will need to be altered in response to that. And that's going to be their response. So in animals, obviously animals have motility. They can move. They are able to move towards or away from favourable or unfavourable conditions. They can get up and walk around or they can swim or they can fly. Um, so that's most of what we measure when we're measuring these responses in animals is we're measuring their movement. And there's two kind of focuses. One is direction and one is frequency of movement. And we'll look at those in a minute in more detail. With plants, plants can't get up and walk away. That's not to say plants don't move or can't move. They obviously can move various parts of them. And really what we mean by that is that they alter their growth. So they can change the direction or the type of growth that's happening at root tips and shoot tips in order to respond to changes in their environment or respond to stimuli. They can't physically get up and move their whole organism. Um, but obviously they have um, methods, some things in seed dispersal that can move seeds further away from them and potentially move the seeds to a more favorable environment when that happens. But as an individual plant living, they can't just get up and move around. So that's kind of going to affect the differences between the responses of these two types of organisms. Uh, we're going to look at animal responses in this video, and then we'll move on to plant responses in the next one. Okay, so in mobile organisms, there are two types of innate responses which help them to survive taxis and kinesis, as we've said. Sometimes you'll see this word motile, or they have motility instead of the word mobile. And obviously that just means they can move around. They have the ability to move. Um, and so we're thinking about anything that can move. It's not just going to be animals. We're talking about things like swimming bacteria. And even it can be the case of individual cells. So obviously there are some cells in your body that can move around. White blood cells, for example, are another example that display um, taxes of some kind because they can move in response to a stimulus. So let's have a look at the two different types of responses. They are both innate responses, and that just means they're not learned. So these are responses that you're born with, or an animal or an organism is born with. It's encoded in their kind of DNA to respond to certain conditions in a certain way when they are detected. That doesn't mean to say these aren't necessarily choices, but they're going to be ways of behaviour that have not been taught by another organism to them or they've, they've learned it from watching other organisms, it would have been ingrained in their DNA and that they would have been born with. Okay, so taxis, the taxis is the plural. 
So you have a taxis or the plural is taxis. A tactic response is directional. So taxis or taxis, a taxis is a directional response. So the movement has to be in a direction. The direction that the stimulus is coming from will determine the direction of the movement in response. So if the stimulus should, needs to be coming from a certain direction or you can be able to tell which direction it's coming from, then the response will either be to move towards that stimulus or away from that stimulus. That means that the response is also directional. So the stimulus will have to be coming from a certain direction and then the response will be to move towards it or away from it so the response has a direction. If an organism moves towards the stimulus, that is counted as a positive response for a positive taxis. If they move away, it's a negative response for a negative taxis. And that's how we describe the direction. Kinesis or kinesis, plural, is slightly different. They are somewhat more random and they are non-directional. And this will make a bit more sense when we go into some examples, but they do not rely on the direction of a stimulus coming from one place. It's about the intensity of the stimulus and how it affects the speed of the movement in response. So if this is sort of more examples of things like light, if that light can be directional, but things like temperature, humidity, um, I'm trying to some other things, but anything where it can be in the whole environment in an area where it's not going to just be, you wouldn't have a temperature coming from a certain direction, most likely you'll have hot areas and cooler areas and there'll be a gradient there. Same for humidity. So they're more likely to be able to follow a gradient of change, but there isn't necessarily going to be a direction for them to follow. So in those certain conditions, high humidity, low humidity, high temperature, low temperature, how intense the stimulus is, whether they want to be in that high temperature or want to be in that low temperature will affect how fast their response is and this again will make a bit more sense when we go through examples but basically if you think about it if you're moving around in a random motion more often if you're in an area that you don't want to be in that is going to increase your chances of you being able to get out of that area faster so if you move around slower in an area you want to stay in you're less likely to accidentally wander out of that condition. And again, when we look at some examples, I'll go through that one more time. Okay, so we're gonna go through some taxis examples first. The prefix of a response indicates the stimulus. So as well as having positive or negative to give you the idea of towards or away, we also have this idea of a prefix. So before the word taxis, we have a pre short prefix at the start, and that indicates the stimulus that they're moving towards or away from. So we're going to have a look at some examples in animals and prokaryotes, because remember they're uh, also cells too as an example, but single cells, as long as they can move, uh, also count here. So the first one is phototaxis. So the prefix is light because photo means light. So they're moving towards or away from light. Chemotaxis, chemo being chemical. So towards or away from a chemical source or a molecule. Rheotaxis, rio comes from the Greek from the word stream. So this is to do with them towards or away from the flow of a current in water. Okay, so let's have a look at phototaxis. Um, as I said, you don't need to learn all of these off by heart. It's not kind of something you have to learn these examples exactly, but you need to be able to interpret. So the word before the word taxis, they kind of figure out what that means. So these are some examples you might get in questions. And then also to kind of justify, explain why this taxis might be useful for this organism in terms of survival. So why is this response happening? Why is it important? So we're going to start with phototaxis. So towards or away from light, we've got an example of euglena. You might have heard of euglena, and it's often used as a single-celled organism example, down all the way to key stage three. Uh, it's photosynthetic, it contains chloroblasts, it's motile, it can swim. So we've got lots of features here, and it shows positive phototaxis. So we've got a torch there, a direction of light is coming from that torch specifically, and the euglena will therefore move towards that light. So it shows positive phototaxis, 
And that makes sense because it's photosynthetic. So if it has chloroplasts, it can carry out photosynthesis. It's going to want to move towards where there's light so that it can do that in order to receive the nutrients. It also has a tail, a flagella, which allows it to swim. And it also has a photoreceptor, which allows it to detect the light and therefore know in which direction to swim. So all of that makes sense. Obviously, it can be the opposite. There can be other examples where something might want to move away from the light and show negative phototaxis. And that might be because they want to hide from predators and be in the dark, or they might know that if moving towards where there's less light, it's cooler, moist um, area, that might be a, an environment they want to live in. So it depends on what they're able to detect. If they're able to detect light, they might be able to know that that might mean uh, less light means low temperatures and more wet areas and dark and damp is where they live and so that's where they want to go. It could also be that they just know that they can hide from things in the dark as well. There's, there's all sorts of reasons why moving away from light might be important, especially if you're not a photosynthetic organism. So chemotaxis, this is looking at example in bacteria. It could also be phagocytes. Remember, they also move towards or away from pathogens, in phagocytes case, towards pathogens. Um, in this case, we've got a bacteria and we've got some chemical substrate that it can use as an energy source. And it has a flagellum again, so it can swim towards this substrate. It's gonna be showing positive chemotaxis. It's gonna swim or move towards that substrate because then it's going to be able to get more food, more of these molecules that it can use as an energy source, which it can use in some form of respiration. And therefore, it will help it to survive because it will have more energy to carry out processes, reproduce, um, swim away or swim to other sources of food. All of that makes more sense. In bacteria, there could be an, uh, an argument for a negative chemotaxis if it was a chemical that was harmful. For example, um, salt, extremes of pH an antibiotic, anything that could be a dangerous chemical for the bacteria, then they're going to demonstrate negative chemotaxis. Any movement from the bacteria also need to be detected, so they'd be able to need to be able to detect that chemical with receptors on their cell wall. That could also be a question. Okay, so let's move on to reotaxis. So if the flow of current is flowing down a stream or a river in this direction, then the fish often face opposite that current. So towards the way the current is flowing, they swim against the current, and this enables them to make sure that the current is flowing towards their mouths and therefore in and over their gills quite easily. And that water is going to be bringing oxygen and food into their mouths. So it increases the rate of flow of oxygen over the gills, it reduces the amount they need to kind of pump with their operculum. So they can literally sit with their mouths open, opercular flaps open, the water can flow in, over the gills and out. And it also increases the amount of food that's going to be coming in that direction, because often any dissolved particles or dissolved small organisms, um, crustaceans, krill, anything really small that, that normally that the fish are going to be eating will be kind of floating on that water, dissolved in that current and will then flow into the mouth. So this is helpful because obviously it increases the rate of flow of oxygen, as I said, but also it lowers the amount of energy that the fish needs to use. Yes, there needs to be a small amount of swimming against the current to keep from being sort of um, washed away or moved along by it, but if they just then need to hold open their mouths and the food and the oxygenated water is just gonna flow in, that's much less effort than if you had to go out and hunt your food or had to try and keep flapping open the opercular that you've got to try and pump water in and out. Okay, so finally, let's have a look at some examples of kinesis in animals and prokaryotes as well. So remember, this is non-directional random movement. So it's not something that's going in a specific direction or towards or away from something. It is random and it does that direction. And again, we've got three terms here. So orthokinesis, clinokinesis, and photokinesis. Photo is obvious, it's light again. So that one should be quite easy to remember. The other two, but these are not terms you need to learn at all. They're not featured in the spec. And so don't worry if you've not seen these before. 
it was mostly so I could just carry on this pattern of talking about the taxis and the kinesis names. But realistically, we're just going to learn some examples of how the behaviour changes and why that might be useful for the organisms in these situations. So orthokinesis is just talking about faster movements in an unfavourable environment. So, for example, wood lice is a good example. And this is part of that required practical where you look at the movement of organisms or the behaviour of organisms in different environments. Wood lice is one of the ones we often use. So the favourable environment for wood louse is the dark, moist and cool temperatures. They normally live underneath wet and rotting logs or underneath leaf litter. Therefore, the unfavourable environment would be the opposite. So anything light, dry and hot. That is because as insects, they have a waterproof skeleton, so they need to retain moisture inside. And so they need to open their spiracles in order to do gas exchange. But don't want to lose too much water when they do that so keeping in a dark moist cool environment means they can hide from predators and they will retain that water so moving faster increasing the speed of their movements random movement remember when they're in conditions that are less means that they will spend less time there because in theory if you're moving around a lot when you're in an unfavorable environment there is more chance that you will be able to leave the environment and enter the environment that you want to be in. But the opposite is true. So if they slow down and move a lot less when they're in their favourable environment, they'll spend a longer time there than they would do in the unfavourable one. So they're spending more time in a condition that they want to be in. So let's think about what that might look like. Often this is the kind of image you will get is that they tracked or traced the movement of some organism. It could be in a tank, it could be top down looking at its movement on the floor of a cage or whatever, but you, you'll be able to see this kind of idea of tracing the movement. So you've got a light environment, part of the environment, and a dark part of the environment, and the organism can move in between easily and freely, and they've tracked their movement. And this will be in a set time. So in a set amount of time, or a same amount of time in each half, or in, within 10 minutes, for example, they spent way more time moving around their movements were way faster they were moving more and they were faster movement in there and then if you track the movement from the dark side compared to the light they spent a lot more time in there because they were moving around slower more slowly and so then that you can kind of suggest from that they spend more time in the dark than in the light and their movements are faster in the light that's the response and they're doing that because they want to spend more time in that favorable condition more turns so clinokinesis is talking about more turns being made in an unfavorable environment so this is this idea that turning right angle turns or just turning around and changing direction for the same reasons is going to help them get out of that environment faster so an example is flatworms so these will most likely be swimming flatworms they again like it quite dark they like the dark conditions so if they are put into a high light intensity or as the light intensity, if it's hot or it's very bright, their reaction is to turn more frequently. So they increase the frequency of the number of turns. And that means that, again, they are hoping to ideally spend less time in that environment and they're turning randomly in the different directions. If they turn faster and more often, they're more likely to turn back around or turn back to being in an environment that they want to be in. And then when they're in the dark or they're in the environment they want to be in, they will turn much less frequently, which in theory should keep them in that environment for longer. So again, let's take a quick example. We've got a light side and a dark side of say a tank, and then we've been able to trace the movement of the flatworms when put into the light versus when they manage to get into the dark and how many turns. And it could be as simple as literally just counting the number of turns. So having looked at this data, I've worked out that there's 25 turns. So they, the, the flatworm turned, changed direction 25 times in the light versus only changing or turning eight times in the dark. And so they would have spent a lot longer in the dark than in the light out of the whole time um, of being in the tank. And so you can tell that that's that's when they would spend their more favourable conditions in the dark. Again, this is one of those things that it could be a different, completely different example, completely different piece of data. It could be tracking movements like this. It could just be 
amount of time spent in each half. It could be number or time fast and speed of movement. But if it's something like that, it's going to be a kinesis. It's not that they are moving directly in a straight line towards the light or moving directly away from the light. They're not doing that. You can see in these pathways, they're going really kind of random, pinging around random movement, but it's about how fast it is or the speed or how many turns, for example, that's going to give you an indication of what the kinesis is. What are they, what do they not like versus what do they like in terms of the conditions? So then we have photokinesis, which is kind of similar to the others. So in both of these examples, I've used light, dark examples. These could obviously be high temperature, low temperature, dry and humid. All of the other opposite things that we talked about that are non-directional stimuli. Light can also be non-directional. So light doesn't always come from a direct source. But even if it does, in this case, it's not about the movement relating to a direction so the movement here is still random they're not moving towards the light or away from the light but when they are in a higher light intensity or as light intensity increases they might speed up their movements or verse, vice versa as light intensity decreases they might speed up their movements and that can sort of make sense for the same reasons we've talked about with the other two examples we've looked at they might increase their speed. So they could be moving really slowly in the dark. The light intensity increases because they hit a patch of light. They speed up really quickly and move really fast. And then so kind of meandering movement. And that can be because they run up from something underneath a cupboard and it's gone from being really dark to really light. Panic. They move faster in order to try and get quickly to be back in the dark again because they're more likely to be seen by predators in the light. And so it helped them to reduce the chances of predation or because if they are a photosynthetic organism, more light energy means more photosynthesis means they have a higher metabolic rate. And so they have more energy to move around. So it might just be that their movements are faster because their metabolic rate has increased. There's different reasons why this could be a benefit, but this is a different reaction to light than phototaxis. It's non-directional. It's just increase in light intensity might cause an increase in speed of movement as opposed to direction of movement. Ouch! This is why in some videos I like explain scratches. <laughs> 